The top three spots were swept by drivers making their first start of the year. Winston Orwell took the Prolapse Pole Award over Trek Togger, who won at Watkins Glen last year. And Lucas Sweeney starts third, making his first appearance since 2015. Today, the Farklow Dollar Series will run its first ever race in Nightvale, a friendly desert community where the sun is hot, the moon is beautiful, and mysterious lights pass overhead while we all pretend to sleep. Yes, Night Vale is very much like other places that Fark has visited over the years. It is a simple, charming town filled with simple, charming people. But Night Vale is also unlike many places that Fark has visited over the years. And it didn't take long for unusual events to start taking place, starting with, most notably, the absence of points leader Rick Forrest. Forrest had been battling a particularly nasty case of throat spiders ever since visiting Night Vale, and that, coupled with his lack of road course experience, meant that he could not turn in a lap fast enough to qualify for the race. So unfortunately for Forrest, who has been leading the championship ever since his big win at Texas World, his closest competitors, especially second place Bob Steffens, are going to be very eager to launch an assault on his lead. Mark Thompson, who was sixth in points, also failed to qualify initially, but he will be racing today. Billy Wayne Klinger, after receiving one of the wildcard spots, stepped aside and will let Mark Thompson drive car number 01 in his place. That was awfully nice of Klinger, and I'm sure he was very pleasantly surprised by the cash gift he received from Ron Oil after doing so. This race will be run a little bit differently than other races on the FARC calendar because the Night Vale race organizers insisted on completely throwing out the FARC rulebook and providing their own. In a lucky coincidence, their rulebook is almost identical to the FARC rulebook, except for a few key details, namely uh, the pitting rules. Uh, the teams will not be allowed to service their own cars, instead, Cars will pull to the side of the road on the front stretch to be serviced by squads of hooded figures. And hooded figures will also be allowed to congregate on both ends of the runway being used as the backstretch for today's race. The drivers have been explicitly instructed to not approach the hooded figures. Otherwise, there may be unpleasant consequences. Their words, not mine. And now we take you trackside for the start of the visitable Night Vale 100. The pace car pulls off to the side, putting the field under the control of Winston Orwell and Trek Togger. And Orwell gets a great jump off the line, clearing Trek Togger easily, and Lucas Sweeney is going to follow him. Homeland Security Surveillance, I'm sure, is very proud to see their car up front right away, as they work very closely with the city of Night Vale to maintain cameras all over town, on street corners, in bushes, carried by birds, and even inside people's homes to keep Night Vale safe and entertaining for the many entities who keep a watch over things. Yes, Homeland Security Surveillance can see everything, except apparently for the piece of debris that Winston Orwell runs over on lap two, cutting down with one of his tires and forcing him to pit. The squad of hooded figures gets to work on car 24, and this is going to set him back, though fortunately, he stays on the lead lap. Brickhead started 24th in the number 64 M&J machine, but he's gonna tear through the, during these opening laps, and now overtakes his teammate Kevin Monroe, so the 64 team Seems to have missed the qualifying setup, but definitely not the race setup, at least on this uh, short run so far. But Rick Head showing no signs of slowing down. He's already challenging uh, Riley Durbin and Timothy Ruiz. He was scored in 14th at the end of lap three. Further up the track, don't worry. Defending champion Chuck Johnson is not being chased by the, sh by the sheriff's secret police. That is Harry S. Anola proudly carrying the secret police colors, the very stealthy combination of dark red with gold racing stripes. Anola trying to challenge Johnson for seventh, 
is looking to make the secret police proud. Especially because he'll be charged with a misdemeanor if he fails to win this race. So, go get them, Sergeant Enola, if you want to keep your freedom. Alexa Lake, in the number 26 for Master Sport Racing, has gone up in smoke. She pulls off to the side to retire from this race. Oh, it looks like the hooded figures have not taken kindly to Alexa Lake blowing smoke in their faces, and so they have whisked her away to parts unknown. I'm sure we'll see her again someday. Lap 12, Brickhead continues to tear through the field. He has broken into the top 10 now, and Chuck Johnson is trying to keep him at bay. But really, what can he hope to accomplish if everyone behind him has also crumbled in the face of the unstoppable force known as Rick Head? Head tries to clear him as they get onto the runway, but Chuck Johnson is fighting back around the outside. Maybe Rick Head has met his match. But Johnson seems to have stalled out. Head is picking up more speed. It looks like he's going to be able to claim that spot after all. Rickhead continuing his impressive march through the, through the field in his first appearance for m &J Racing this season. And just ahead of these two, the doppelgang teammates do battle. George Bryan coming after Brian George. This is the battle for sixth as we start. Lap 15, Danica Hollifield back there in that brown and gold car is a lap down. And here comes Rickhead shooting around the outside of George Bryan. So he's gonna throw a monkey wrench into their duel here. Of course, the doppelgang car owner, whoever they may be, did put out a statement uh, claiming that the team was trying a secret innovative race strategy. I'm not sure how the, uh, the doppelgang teammates battling each other is going to contribute towards that strategy, but we will see how that plays out as Zachary Zins currently runs in third place. He, he's uh, just picked his way past the lapped car of Hunter Blaze. Zachary Zins made his last FARC start in the 2015 season finale. Since then, he has taken up residence in Night Vale and supports himself with a podcast that he records in his trailer out in the Scrublands. Winston Orwell has quickly made up a lot of ground after his unscheduled pit stop on lap three. He has just gotten by Harry S. Anola, and this will put him back into the top 10. So like Rick Head, Orwell has gone on a tear through the field of his own. But we're gonna see the massive lead that Lucas Sweeney has pulled out to as he crosses the line to begin lap 20. Second place Trek Togger in the purple and black 74 just crosses the line now. Several lapped cars in between him and third place Zachary Zins. Jim Kidd in the 18 is another lap down. Here comes Bob Steffens running fourth. Uh, Brian George fifth. Rickhead sixth. Uh, Brian George seventh. George Bryan eighth. George Bryan's gonna come across in ninth. And now we're waiting on 10th place Winston Orwell. There he is in car 24. So this field has gotten very spread out over the first 20 laps. No caution so far. That has helped Lucas Sweeney really stretch out his lead. Battle for fourth is really heating up as Rick Head has now caught Bob Steffens and Brian George. And he's going to take that spot easily as the 7 and 515 decide to play in the dirt instead. Now even though Bob Steffens is under attack, he is still in very, very good shape. If he can keep that car on the road and out of trouble as he is in position to take the points lead thanks to uh, championship leader Rick Forrest failing to qualify. And Steffens, of course, is sitting second coming into this race. So Steffens and Team Thunder are certainly looking forward to having a field day. But Steffens coming back after the 5.15. He can definitely afford to be a little conservative, but still, he's going for every point that he possibly can. Lucas Sweeney is in trouble. Coming to the end of lap 23, looks like he's cut a tire down now. So for the second time today, the leader has to make an emergency pit stop. So it looks like Sweeney is going to hand the lead over to Trek Togger. No, wait, that's Brian George in the 515. Our cameras must have missed it, but Brian George made an incredible tear through the field in just a few short laps. 
So, he leapfrogged Trek Togger, and now he has taken over the lead. But we are coming up on routine pit stops pretty soon, and Lucas Sweeney has remained on the lead lap. So, Sweeney now has gotten service. So he should cycle back to the front once everybody else has stopped. But we're gonna get a yellow flag as Scott Wheeler gets turned around by uh, Roy Warren. Uh, Wheeler was brought onto the Hollifield team allegedly for his road course experience, but he has really struggled this weekend. And now he's struggling to comprehend the idea that walls are solid objects. So he's gonna be uh, dropping debris all over the track as he rams into that wall repeatedly. The judgmental eyes of those hooded figures congregating at the end of the runway looking on. That is assuming that the hooded figures have eyes. And while the field comes around to take the yellow flag, Todd Stater with an engine failure pulls into the infield and there's an explosion under the car. It seems that Todd Stater has forgotten that there are landmines in the infield. And we've had an accident in the pit lane as Monica Rook smashes into the back of Packer Carroll. Now some traffic jams were expected as these drivers aren't exactly used to pulling off to the side of the road to pit. But this is how the Night Vale race organizers have demanded that things be done. And Rook is not done smashing into cars coming out of the pit lane. She runs right into the back of former race leader Brian George. So that's gonna be someone else who would like a word with Monica Rook once this race is done, and if I were Monica Rook, I would run. Because, evidently, nobody has faced the Doppelgang's team owner and lived to tell about it. Or was it, is it Packer Carroll I'm thinking of? She ran into both of them. Oh well, we'll find that out later, as Lucas Sweeney has cycled back to the front. Of course, he did not need to pit under that yellow and he's got the lapped car of Kenny George in between himself and the rest of the field. Lucas Sweeney of course took over the lead after Winston Orwell pitted on lap three. But cautions are gonna breed cautions as Lev Azarov turns around right in front of traffic. Riley Durbin runs into him. Winston Orwell gets involved and Zach Webster piles into the back of the 24. So that's gonna take Azarov and Webster out of this race. Lucas Sweeney leads on this restart. Brian George gets a terrible start, holding up Brian George and stacking up the rest of the field, allowing Sweeney to get away. Zachary Sins continues to run third, looking for a way to get by second place. Brian George, but now he comes under attack from George Bryan. We've started to receive some uh, interesting communications from the Triple Nine team. Zachary Zins has been quoted as saying, uh, these men are not the men they were at dawn. Perhaps it's a coded strategy call to his team. Checking back in on Harry Asanola, who is just disappointing the Sheriff's Secret Police right now as he is struggling to break out of the lower top 10, comes under attack from Timothy Ruiz, a little bit of contact with the 112. We're being told that if Vanola doesn't pick it up, the secret police are definitely going to want a word with him after this race. We just saw one of the doppelgang cars pulled off to the side of the road and come to a stop. That is Brian George running in second place, so more problems for him after he was run into by Monica Rook on pit road. That brings out the caution once again. But luckily for the doppelgang, they have and Armada coming after Lucas Sweeney on this restart. The doppelgang pouring everything they've got into this one race, and it shows they've really helped the car count today. But so far, they've been no match for Lucas Sweeney, but Sweeney's getting a bit careless driving off the road. Sweeney is definitely not gonna get back into victory lane driving like that. Zachary Zins. Uh, still trying to make something happen from third place, but he's being swarmed by the doppelgang cars. And it doesn't help that he seems to have become more and more agitated over his radio. Maybe the desert heat is starting to get to him. And it may have gotten to Harry Asanola as he turns Brian George around. 
Sending him spinning off into the dirt. We stay green though. But now his teammate, George Bryan, is in trouble. He gets turned around and backs into the wall where that official is stationed. Luckily, he's okay, but this is going to bring the caution out on lap 36. This is definitely going to be one of those up and down days for the Doppelgang. They've got several of their cars running up front, but several of their cars running into trouble as well. Lucas Sweeney comes around to take the yellow flag. Lucas Sweeney making his first appearance in the series since 2015. He's looking for his first win since 2015 as well. Now, the communications over at the Zachary Zins team are starting to get a little ridiculous as he's now claiming that every other car on the track is a doppelgang car. Now, I don't know about you, but I think he just might be a little frustrated that he can't get away from the doppelgang cars that he's been battling with for position all day. And frankly, maybe a little jealous too, because the doppelgang has certainly uh, done their part to contribute to a healthy car count for this weekend's race, while Zins only has one car on hand. So I think Zachary Zins should just stop whining and figure out how to outdrive these doppelgang cars so he could catch up to Wait a minute, where did Lucas Sweeney go? Something must have happened to the eight because uh, Brian George has now taken over the lead. Come to think of it, where did all the other teams go to? Surely more teams showed up than just the Doppelgang and Zachary Zins. And now that I recall, the Doppelgang only had two cars on the entry list, Brian George and George Bryan. Ladies and gentlemen, something sinister has happened here at the Visitable Night Vale 100. We are witnessing an unprecedented attempt by one team to manipulate the outcome of this race by body snatching the rest of their competitors. But they have not gotten to Zachary Zins. Zins has my deepest apologies. He wasn't frustrated nor jealous nor overcome by the heat. He knew something was wrong from the start, and we dismissed him. And now he is truly alone in this race, pitted against a great evil that has conspired to steal their competitors' results, prize money, and possibly their lives. Do not believe the lies, race fans. That is not Brian George leading. That used to be Lucas Sweeney. And somewhere deep inside that mindless drone, Lucas Sweeney, a small part of him remains, begging, screaming, clawing for a way out. Race Control has had enough of this unprecedented assault on, on the fair competition that Fark strives for. And they have thrown the yellow flag with just 10 laps to go. That is not a whole lot of time to gather up the field and sort this mess out. But even though we've now got the doppelgang drones cornered, this will not be a battle that mortal eyes can bear to witness. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we are forced to cut the feed and take you to the weather. can seem such a serious thing a world apart embroidered a heart bachelor party for the hundredth monkey but memory falters for ancient fathers thoughts they come and come and come begetting all these trying times Coolly scanning all your skies 
sighing, 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 why? Invisible hands move native lands, touch pre-dawn sisters, talk with broken transistors, short-term memories for the nothing that could be. We've just run the numbers on long-distance runners. Just because there is nothing doesn't mean you're a blank man. Just because there isn't anything doesn't mean you're a blank man. Bothered, hot, yet sweetly tempered, how can it be that I am dignified? I guess it's so, who gives a fuck? What else could you expect, I'd say? Young, fun, dreamer, full of sparks Sporting gay in my mind You're spraying your day off Welcome back, race fans. The battle is won. The doppelgang drones have been sent back to the deep trenches of hell from whence they came, and all of the original cars and drivers have been restored perfectly. Lucas Sweeney reassumes his rightful place in the race lead, but he does not remember what happened between when he was snatched and now. Perhaps it is best that he never knows. Trek Togger in car 74, he is the first car one lap down, and Brian George, the original Brian George, it sits in second place. His teammate George Bryan is third, Timothy Ruiz has had uh, taken over fourth sometime during the mass body snatching, setting Zachary Zins back to fifth. Coming to seven laps to go, the pace car leaves the field in the hands of Lucas Sweeney, but Sweeney pulls off to the side. He's got another cut tire, so he's going to have to make an emergency pit stop and give up the lead for the second time today. What a heartbreaker for Sweeney. He finally gets his body back, and he's not going to be able to finish what he started and go on to take the victory in today's race. This now hands the lead over to Brian George as they take the caution. There's been an incident on the runway and Trek Togger is going to be able to come around and rejoin the tail end of the lead lap. Now here's a replay of the frankly disturbing incident we've just had. Kenny George drives off the track and plunges right into the wall. Poor Kenny George just couldn't handle the, the magnitude of the events that just took place and drove into the wall in a fit of insanity. But fortunately, he got out of that car and reported that he now can't remember anything. Concussions are truly a lifesaver. Brian George continues to lead on the restart, just four laps remaining now. Timothy Ruiz has made his way up to second, but he's got the lapped car of Kevin Monroe to deal with. I'm not sure what Munro's trying to accomplish by racing the leaders. Maybe he doesn't realize that he's a lap down in uh, all the confusion that has just happened. But Zachary Zins takes advantage of Ruiz going off into the dirt, takes over second for himself. The 112 team opened up the season with three consecutive top 10 qualifying efforts, but other than an eighth place at Nashville, he just hasn't had the results to back it up. Meanwhile, Brian George has taken the white flag. And let me tell you, the doppelgang has really uh, turned it around on such short notice. 
Race Control had a very long talk with them under this caution, and it turns out they just weren't that confident coming into this race, and so they tried to compensate by coming up with this body snatching scheme to ensure victory, but Race Control had such an inspiring speech for them under caution that it convinced them to just believe in themselves. And now, armed with a new can-do attitude, Brian George rounds the final corner and takes the victory in the visitable Night Vale 100. That just goes to show you that a little self-confidence can go a long way as the doppelgang ends up in victory lane without any further use of black magic. Zachary Zins holds off Timothy Ruiz for second, George Bryan puts the second doppelgang car in the top five. Winston Orwell and Lucas Sweeney recover nicely, finishing fifth and sixth after their troubles from the race lead. Unfortunately, Harry Asanola was promptly arrested by the Sheriff's Secret Police after finishing seventh, way off the mark from their goal for him of winning the race. So, way to go, Harry Asanola. You've completely embarrassed your sponsor, and so you deserve to face the consequences. Trek Togger took advantage of getting himself back onto the lead lap and picked off a few more spots to finish 8th. Billy Ray Smith Thompson 9th, Billy Bob Childers rounds out the top 10, Bob Steffens 11th, Rick Head unfortunately stalled out and finishes 12th, the last car on the lead lap. His teammate Kevin Monroe was the first car one lap down, and everybody up till 21st place, Hunter Blaze finishes one lap down, Mark Thompson and Scott Wheeler finished way back 22nd and 23rd, five laps down. Kenny George was the first car out after his temporary bout of madness. And Alexa Lake, who of course finished last and was taken away by the hooded figures, eventually turned up again in her own home. She reportedly thought that this race was all a dream until she realized that she had 16 extra points that she did not have before. Bob Steffens will leave Night Vale as the new points leader by 29 over Rick Forrest. So Forrest is not at much of a disadvantage. Zach Webster still sits third. Harry Asanola sits fourth, but this will be his last race for some time. Not just because he's going to prison, but because his next scheduled appearance isn't until race 15 at Indianapolis Raceway Park. But even then, there is no telling how long he'll be at the mercy of the sheriff's secret police. But enough about that, Hunter Blaze and Roy Warren are separated by just three points in the Rookie of the Year battle. Warren hasn't quite been the fastest, but he's been very consistent with four top 15 finishes this season, so he's gonna make that battle very interesting with Hunter Blaze if he can keep it up. But just one point behind Warren sits Mark Thompson, Riley Durbin is 8th, defending champion Chuck Johnson is 9th, Kevin Monroe 10th, and Jim Kidd and Ashley Tucker round out the top 12. The Night Vale race organizers are hopeful for a return to the schedule in 2018. To this proposal, FARC race director Jen Walker said, Oh, sure. I mean, we'll definitely think about it. We absolutely loved being here. And then she, along with the rest of the FARC officials, promptly sped away back to the FARC offices in Texas. In the aftermath, FARC officials put out a statement explaining that while this race will stand, all references to the city of Night Vale will be stricken from the record books, leaving the visitable Night Vale 100 as just a phantom race that took place on this day and was won by Brian George, and that is all that anyone will ever need to remember. Next week, the Fark Wagon Train heads to the Elko Speedway in Minnesota for the Fossline Heavy Duty Trailers 6060s, the next double header on the schedule. And you can catch all the action right here on the Fark Racing Network. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just received an update concerning Harry Asanola and his arrest earlier today. 
It seems that the Pearson Sweeney Motorsports team, when they went to load up car number 45 onto the truck, they discovered that it had gone missing. There were no witnesses to the vehicle's disappearance, and the team's other two cars, Lucas Sweeney's number 8 and Billy Ray Smith Thompson's number 2, were both accounted for. The team filed a report with the Sheriff's Secret Police, but they have left Night Vale empty-handed. Hours later, there was an escape from the Secret County Jail. You know, the Secret County Jail with the big neon sign out front that says Secret County Jail? The same Secret County Jail in which Harry Enola was being held. Reports have revealed that Enola is now missing and images have surfaced revealing a race car shaped hole in the building's exterior. Apparently, Enola had smuggled his race car into the prison, hiding it on his person, waiting for the wardens to take their eyes off of him for just one quick moment. Enola seized the opportunity, hopping into his race car, firing the engine, and breaking that wall down. But he wasn't free yet, as the secret police would now be looking for him. Luckily, his race car looked exactly like the cars driven on the road by the secret police, right down to the big number on the side and the fart contingency decals. So Enola blended into traffic, posing as an officer of the sheriff's secret police, doing as the secret police would do, including stopping his car and blocking traffic in the middle of Main Street, jumping out, and while waving his arms, shouting, I am not an officer of the sheriff's secret police. I am a fugitive on the run. Just as an officer of the sheriff's secret police would do. With his disguise working perfectly, nobody noticed as Enola turned onto Route 800, headed west, and floored it, speeding down the highway, expertly dodging traffic. The highway patrol gave chase, but they were no match for Enola's purpose-built race car. Not that the Highway Patrol would have been able to leave Night Vale and continue their chase, as Night Vale just has a way of keeping locals inside while letting outsiders escape easily. And so, Harry S. Enola continues to speed west. On his way to returning his race car to Pearson Sweeney Motorsports, and returning to as normal of a life as a fart driver can have. Good night, race fans. Good night.